Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the WellBe podcast. This is your host, Adrian Nolan Smith, and I am thrilled to have a repeat guest, which is very unusual for the WellBe podcast, but my friend, Dr. Will Bolswitz. Will, thank you very much for being here. Welcome. Oh, Adrian, it's awesome to be here. I'm, uh, it's always great to get connected with you and record. Well, I'm thrilled to have you back. And for anybody that hasn't seen Will's first interview on the WellBe podcast um, or isn't familiar with him otherwise, he is double board certified in gastroenterology and internal medicine. He's also a graduate of Vanderbilt University, Georgetown Medical School, and got a master's in clinical investigation, which I think is fascinating. You have to tell me more about that, uh, from Northwestern University in Chicago, where I also went to grad school. So we share that in common. Um, he's the author of the best selling book all about gut health called Fiber Fueled, and also the author of the new cookbook called The Fiber Fueled Cookbook. So, Will. Lots of great stuff to talk about today. Um, let's jump right in. Fiber Fueled, as I mentioned, was all about plant-based diet and the health of your microbiome, your gut microbiome. And so this follow-up book, The Fiber Fueled Cookbook, um, really adds on to that and obviously also has some recipes, um, but really also dives into, since you were very kind and uh, sent me a copy for me to read through food allergies and food sensitivities, which you know I don't think was quite as big a focus in fiber fueled. So can you just tell us right away, what is the difference between a food allergy and a food sensitivity? And how can someone tell if they have one or the other? Sure, so uh, food allergies, I'm actually gonna call it a food intolerance. Um, so food intolerances versus food allergies. It's important for people to understand that um, these are radically different things. And the reason I say that is because I feel like people are conflating it unintentionally and putting them together. Food allergies is when your immune system actually gets activated in response to a food in your diet. You know, the word allergy, I mean, think about that, like seasonal allergies, that's your immune system reacting to pollen, or um, could be that you're allergic to your cat, pet dander, okay. So in the case of food allergies, it's that there's something in your diet that is activating the immune system. And the thing about this is as a medical doctor, I'm actually quite scared of food allergies because they can be violent. They can be very dangerous. You know, they can cause people to feel like their throat is closing off and they can't breathe or they break out in hives, things of this variety. And um, when that occurs, it could be the most trivial, small amount of exposure you're not even necessarily trying to eat the food. You may accidentally come into contact with the food, and yet it will trigger this big, dangerous reaction. This is why, Adrian, we can't have peanuts on the airplane anymore, right? Like the person who has the peanut allergy, they're not, they're not actually opening the bag and eating the peanuts. It's just like the most trivial exposure to the peanuts could activate that response. Now, a food intolerance is a very different thing. And that's good because food intolerances are more common than food allergies. Food allergies are not that common. Food intolerances affect about one in five people in the United States. And essentially, this is when you consume a food and then you manifest symptoms, typically digestive symptoms. So like classically gas, bloating, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, constipation, things of this variety. You eat the food, you manifest these symptoms that you don't want. And because there's this connection between those two things, that's what a food intolerance is. Food is not supposed to be causing negative symptoms. Food is supposed to be this source of joy, something we find pleasure in. So what's going on there? Well, it's interesting. It's, it's not the immune system. What's happening there is that your body is struggling to process and unpack the food. And most commonly, we are going to find this take place in a person who has damage to their gut microbiome. And the reason why is because the gut microbiome is actually essential to digestion. Like if you took just our digestive enzymes that we have as humans and you, and you removed the gut microbiome, we all would have food intolerances. We would have massive food intolerances. Right? And can so you we, just specify when you mean remove the gut microbiome, you mean all of our outsiders that live with us, right? Yeah, so we have uh, 38 trillion uh, microorganisms living inside of our colon alone. And our whole body, it's close to 40 trillion microbes, including the skin, the mouth, like literally our eyeball has a microbiome. 
they're invisible to the naked eye. So we can't see them. But if you had a microscope, you could zoom in and you would find that you are you are teeming with life, like all parts of you. And but most concentrated in your colon. Yeah, I think and, a lot of people hear the, the term gut microbiome and are thinking of literally your, your colon or your digestive organs. But actually what the microbiome refers to is this whole ecosystem of other bacteria that are or organisms that are living within us. So that's why I wanted you to clarify that. So people know you're not removing your digestive organs when you say that. You're removing all these wonderful microorganisms that help us to break down our food. Well, because I think we we kind of think of ourselves as being these, you know, um isolated creatures. Like we think of ourselves, I'm 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 Will. I'm a human. I'm I'm this is who I am, right? And I don't think of myself as being Will the, you know, super organism that has like all these little invisible creatures as a part of my body, right? But they're there and they're really necessary for our digestion. That's one of the things that they do. So that's that's where they come into play in these food intolerances. Okay, well, that's a very good clarification. Thank you for that. Um, and just to come back to it, what's the best way for someone to figure out if they have a food sensitivity or a food allergy? So a food allergy, first of all, it, you're going to have these, first of all, you have to have symptoms for both of these. There, there have to be symptoms. If you're not experiencing symptoms, then you don't qualify for either. Um, a food allergy is most typically, it could involve some digestive symptoms, but the manifestation of a food allergy is most commonly going to be outside of the di digestive system. It's going to include other parts of your body. So like, you know, classics include breaking out in hives or, um, you know, the one that we really worry about is like lip swelling, throat swelling, difficulty breathing. If you have these types of symptoms, then it makes sense to have a consultation with a with a allergist and immunologist. So and in working with this allergist, there's no single test that is so reliable that by itself, you could like, for example, do an at home test and figure this out. I, I, I truly would not recommend that. But in working with the medical doctor, as the team, uh, in partnership, there are some tests that can help us to figure this out that include blood tests, and we call a skin prick test where they'll actually like apply a very small amount of the protein underneath your skin and see if your immune system reacts to this very small amount. Now, when it comes to food intolerances, food sensitivities, the, the challenge that exists, and one of the reasons why I wanted to write a book about this is that there's no easy way to answer this question in the sense that like many people just wanna know, hey, can I do a test and get an answer? And unfortunately, that's just not where we're at, at least right now. But there is a foolproof way. There is a gold standard way to answer this question. And that is by applying an old fashioned technique, which is an elimination diet. So, and when I say elimination, I don't mean permanent elimination. Elimination diet, effectively what it means is that you're going to temporarily remove a food and see if your symptoms improve. And then you're gonna bring the food back in and see if the symptoms come back. And if you do this and you discover that like, again, your symptoms improve with removal and they come back when you add it back in, that is uh, evidence that you have a food intolerance. And then, so now you have basically identified what food you're having trouble with. Yes, that was one of my other questions for you was, you know, are there reliable food allergy testing? And, and also, uh, you know, to kind of explain why the elimination diet is that much more effective than what's out there right now as far as food sensitivity and food allergy testing. Yeah, and the elimination diet is going to be really more applicable to sort of the food intolerances versus, you know, if you have a food allergy, typically the approach would not be the food elimination diet. Typically the approach would actually be the testing through blood testing and skin prick testing. And part of the reason why is because like, let's pretend if I have a peanut allergy, if someone else is the allergist, they, they wouldn't want me to reintroduce the peanuts, right? Because that could be potentially dangerous. So instead, we have to look at these other safe ways to really sort of control it. That makes perfect sense. You wouldn't want to yeah, have to use an EpiPen because you were just confirming that you had this life-threatening food allergy. Okay, but for most people that have food intolerances and food sensitivities, you're saying an elimination diet is the gold standard. Do you recommend, because people ask me this a lot, with elimination diets, taking out like all of the major allergens. I think there's like, you know, 
eight of the most popular ones or, or even 13 now that, you know, have some sort of official government stance as a food allergen at once or really only the things you think you might have a sensitivity to? Okay, so let's let's um, uh, make a distinction between what are the foods that cause food allergies versus what are the foods that cause food intolerances, because they're, they're 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 separate processes, and so it's important to make that distinction. Th there's these classic foods that account for at least ninety percent. We think more than ninety percent of food allergies. All right, so these these are the classic foods, and I'm going to list them so that people can hear it and you can think about whether or not this might be something in your own life. But bearing in mind that we think that food allergies only apply to like one to 3% of people. So these include fish, shellfish, eggs, dairy products, uh, peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, corn, and soy. So like, I, I, I'm counting nine, but that includes like fish and shellfish and peanuts and tree nuts, right? So anyway, these are the big ones that we think about. Now it's kind of interesting if you take a step back thinking about food intolerances and you take a step back and you think about these foods that I just listed and what are the most common foods that appear like on our shelves as a part of ultra processed foods, wheat, corn, soy, peanuts, uh, you know, dairy, eggs, right? So I, I personally don't think it's a surprise that the foods that our immune, our immune system is most confused by are the, are the ones that we're also like sort of changing and combining with chemicals as a part of ultra processed foods. I, I think that's a, an explanation potentially for why that is the case. And another thought I, I had is it's usually, well, certainly the case with wheat and, and cow's dairy, right? They're just one, you know, species of like all the grains out there. And it's just been over consumed, right? There's so many different options for grains. And yet most of us only consume grains that have wheat in them or um, consume peanuts as far as nuts, right? Like how many kids eat only peanut butter and not cashew butter and almond butter and macadamia nut butter, all these other things, right? So it's to me, it's also like, we've just taken these one species when there could be so many options in that category and just overexposed ourselves to the point where, um, the next generation is maybe being born with that allergy. That's just a theory of mine. There's no medical so, background to that theory. No, I think you're right. And I think you're right. And what you're speaking to is actually a very important topic, uh, which is the erosion of diversity within our actual diet that's taking place as a result of the food industry. So basically the food system, from their perspective, it's a lot um, more efficient in terms of their bottom line and their ability to make money if they just stick to the stuff that is inexpensive and not complicated. And so, you know, and then here we are and 75% of the plant-based calories that exist in our supermarket come from three plants, wheat, corn, and soy, right? And so, you know, we've gone from this abundant, varied diet down to a very whittled down and focused diet. And we talked about this in our first episode. I'm just gonna equip, put a quick plug into it right now because most people who know me have heard me say this, when we study the microbiome, diversity, diversity within our diet ends up showing up all over the place as being a critical part of supporting a varied complex microbiome. So when the food system says that they're trying to contract the, the diversity in our diet, that, that's a problem because the only way for us to fight back against that and actually protect our, our gut eco ecosystem is for us to make choices independent of what the food system provides to us. And that's where education comes in. This is why our podcast like this is so important. Yes. And I promise you that wasn't a layup to talk about why the diversity in your food matters. I have learned so much from you on this since we first spoke about it. And you're in my mind almost every day when I make a meal about how many different plants I can get into the meal um, to increase my food diversity. But we did not talk about the connection between food intolerances and food allergies when we were first talking about that. So it, it's great to see it come full circle in why that diversity is not only important to feed the different good bacteria in your gut microbiome, but 
also for this, you know, try, trying to avoid allergies and, and intolerances in the next generation, perhaps. This is so good because you don't even realize that you're nailing very important points. You're just speaking from the heart and speaking as a highly intelligent person who's looking at what's happening in the world. But actually, they've looked at this, believe it or not, Adrian, and discovered that di dietary diversity during childhood was actually associated with a reduced likelihood of developing food allergies. How interesting okay. is that? Yeah. Yes. I have been thinking a lot about this as a new mom and my son has been on solids for three months now. And, uh, you know, they talk about the first a thousand days, like everything I read is about the first a thousand days of a child's life and how the eating habits and the diversity of the diet in the first a thousand days can set the patterns and the likes and dislikes and tolerances and intolerances for life. And it's just wild. You know why um, this is? This is because the microbiome develops in the first three years, right? A thousand days is three years, effectively. Okay. Yes. And of course. So, and so, what happens is, from the time that a child is born, um, so you're you're a new mom. I'm a new dad. I have a new baby at home, and um, from the time that that child is born, that's as close as they'll get to a completely undeveloped, clean slate microbiome. And over the course of two to three years is the time range that's when the microbiome ultimately develops and it becomes set into this thing that maybe it's adaptable, but it's pretty darn set up in terms of what you're going to be moving forward through childhood and even into adulthood. So it becomes this really critical phase. And so everything that you're saying is completely accurate. And it's just so interesting because really what you're talking about right now is the microbiome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I might be researching more than the average new mom, maybe not, I don't know, but I'm just so aware of how much my little choices, you know, with each meal are creating this lifetime of impact as far as what he is willing to eat and how he does with certain foods. So um, no pressure, new moms, but it matters. Well, and that's what I was going to say is like speaking as someone who has three kids. So my oldest is eight, my, my daughter is eight, my son is five, and then we have a new baby at home who's only, she's only five weeks. Um, I can just tell you that, first of all, there is no such thing as perfect. So anyone who's hearing this right now, and this includes you, Adrian, like there is no such thing as perfect. There is so much that is going to ebb and flow during your experience as a parent with your child. And there will be times where they will flat out reject, reject the food that you're trying to get to them. And don't worry, your kid will be okay. <laughs> like, because then it just comes back online. It's just like an ebb and flow thing that sometimes you can't have complete control over everything that's happening. Yes, I, um, I'm already there. I'm already realizing that, you know, you trade these little moments and then I'll get back to a question I have for you about food sensitivities, but I'll share a little story, which is that we went to visit my um, in-laws and my father-in-law loves this old fashioned diner in their town, you know, like very old fashioned with the pancakes and the, the syrup that right. is in the packets and the whole thing. And, you know, my wearing my health hat, I'm like, this is a disaster, like processed meat, refined carbohydrates, like all the, you know, tons of gluten, this and that. And my child has this un you know, unblemished, perfect microbiome. I've given him nothing but organic food and breast milk and blah, blah, blah. But the moment, it just brought so much joy to my father-in-law and to the experience as a family with his cousins too, who he doesn't get to see a lot and all enjoying, you know, this very like old school American diner and having his first bite of pancake and this and that, or gumming it, I should say, not bite. Um, and you just kind of got to let it go. I wouldn't let him have like the bacon because I felt more strongly about not letting him have processed meat. And it's harder to gum that anyway, but it was one of those things where I just thought, you know, this is worth it. So perfection doesn't exist and you make these little trade-offs, but I knew he was going right back into, you know, organic plants for, for every other meal. So it was, it was really adorable, but um, okay. So I do want to keep talking about food sensitivities because that is what you are so knowledgeable about. And I want everybody to learn a lot about it today. So in your book, your new book, the cookbook, you talk about the big three of food sensitivities. Can you talk about what those are and why they are the big three? You know, it's interesting. So I guess just to comment real quick on the cookbook, because people hear, oh, the Fiber Fields cookbook, and they're like, well, what is he doing talking about all this stuff, right? And that's because this is actually far more than a cookbook. It's kind of a weird genre-breaking book um, in the sense that it is a cookbook. It's got 125 recipes and full-color photography, but I wrote an 11-chapter book. 
And that 11 chapter book is really intended to be the how of gut health. Because I felt like my first book covered the why. And a big part of my focus is taking people on a step by step process to heal their gut. And so in that step by step process, the very first step from my perspective, needs to always be understanding the root of your problem, root cause understanding. Because we're going to be creating a plan. And in order to create a plan, like the accuracy of that plan is completely contingent on the accuracy of that root cause and understanding it. So it's worthwhile for us to invest energy and time into this first step before we jump towards therapeutics. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was take a person who has food intolerances. Again, this is 75 million Americans, all right? And you, you eat food, it doesn't make you feel well. Okay, we got to figure out what's going on. Let me take you inside my head as a gastroenterologist and teach you some of the things that I'm thinking about if you were sitting there in front of me in the clinic. Because I want to make sure that you have adequately have explored these possibilities with your own doctor. I want to empower you during those really during those encounters and relationships. And the big three of food sensitivity are the three things I call them the big three, because these are the three things that are like, if you come in with food intolerances, I need to know whether or not these three are there. Because if they are there, and I fix them, you're not even going to have to do an elimination diet. This is going to fix your food intolerances by itself. So the big three are, I'll just name, name them real quick, constipation, celiac disease, and gallbladder dysfunction. In all three cases, if I get you pooping, fix the constipation. If I take you off of gluten, fix the celiac disease, or we address a dysfunctional gallbladder that's damaged and, and basically acting up. Your, I, my expectation is that if your food intolerances aren't completely gone, they're at least like radically better. And then we can pick up from there. Does it ever happen that a food intolerance could cause constipation or gallbladder dysfunction by like repeatedly making the body deal with that intolerant food? So food intolerances certainly could cause constipation. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is called the fiber paradox, which is that people who have a damaged gut, they, they really need dietary fiber. That's how you actually heal the gut. And I make that argument in the book. But the problem is that they actually struggle to process that, that fiber. They struggle with it. And if you are a person who is struggling with fiber, dietary fiber, believe it or not, for some people, it actually causes constipation. Even though we all sit there and think, oh, like the, the biggest benefit of fiber is that it makes you poop. And there's so there's this nuance or complexity to the whole thing that needs that I think needs to be acknowledged, which is part of what I'm trying to do in my book is to be, you know, forthcoming and saying, like, I'm not here to tell you that it's all fiber all the time. I'm here to instead help you to find a way that makes you feel better and works with your body. And so um, in terms of like, call it causing gallbladder dysfunction. Honestly, we don't really know exactly where gallbladder dysfunction comes from. I would expect that damage to the gut microbiome is connected. I would expect that. But we, we haven't yet like fully studied this to understand in, in, you know, in, in, in full. We are where we are today. We're going to know a lot more in five years and 10 years. And we're continuing to grow and understand more. I love that you just said that. One of my favorite quotes was from a doctor. I was, um, I was moderating a panel he was on. And right before we started, I was asking him some questions about COVID because he was the, he's the head of infectious disease at Johns Hopkins. And he said, good doctor is a humble doctor. We just don't know. And any doctor that acts you know, confidently about this or that or dismisses an idea as impossible is completely off because how, how could they really know it hasn't really been studied yet that this is you know totally not true so he was just kind of telling me what he knew but it, with a big caveat which is that there's just more that they don't know than what they do know and you know i love that well this um, is this, this is why i try to whenever possible stay open to things that we haven't yet studied right 
because there's ideas that, that exist with, within the health and wellness space. Let me give you a quick example. Ayurvedic medicine. All right. Ayurvedic medicine has been around for like five or 6,000 years. And that is a lot of um, wisdom and experience that ultimately gets distilled into the ideas. All right. And they have their own way of describing what's happening with the body. It's their own sort of, you know, vernacular. And in Western medicine, we have our 21st century research techniques that we really believe in. But it's just observation, right? Our research techniques are a way for us to observe whether or not something seems to be a trend. And so is five or 6,000 years of experience. That's observation too. And it's not a coincidence that there have been a lot of things that in Ayurvedic medicine, they may describe it using different words. But actually, when we study it, it proves to be true. They were absolutely right. And so this is where I think it's very important for us to stay open-minded to possibilities and not be so hard mind about it when we frankly don't really know in a lot of cases. And the, the pandemic was a perfect example. How many people dug a trench and defended that position in that trench saying this is the truth and everything else is wrong. And yet the truth was a moving target the whole time. Like I would rather jump on the horse of science, right. And, and acknowledge that I might be, I might be wrong a couple months ago because I'm, I'm riding the horse of science. I'm going to evolve as the information evolves. And so many people said I'm on the side of science. But then the whole scientific method is about, you know, studying something and then making a hypothesis with the information that you have. But then when the information that you have kept changing, it's like there's no side of science. The side of science is being open minded to the things might change. That is so true. I, don't, I know we're so divergent in this, but I can't help but say this, that I feel like when people start weaponizing the term science, they say, I have science and you don't, Right. That's like an appeal to authority thing where you basically are saying like, my, my opinion is superior to your opinion because I believe that I am more invested into science um, than perhaps someone else is. And I, I don't, I, I, I think that that's just like a very dangerous thing because what we're doing there is actually saying, I refuse to communicate. I refuse to explore nuance. I refuse to, you know, treat you as a human being with a, a real like opinion that I respect. And instead, I'm just going to shut you down. That's, I, I, don't, I don't get that. Let's get back to talking to one another and find common ground. I could talk about this with you for six hours because I was so appalled by people's behavior during all of this with what you just said and on both sides, but more so on the, you know, the, the public health side. Um, and, and it was individuals, you know, people that, really weren't knowledgeable, but we're saying I'm on the side of them. Uh, everything else must be wrong until it wasn't until yes, things changed. <laughs> All right. I have another question for you because it was in your book. Um, you talk about the big three, which you just said was gallbladder dysfunction, uh, constipation and, and celiac disease um, as right. being, uh, you know, sort of, um, I guess the big three of food sensitivity, but then you actually talk about the most common causes of food sensitivity being different from those big three. So can you touch on what those are and why they are different? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. So as I approach a patient, so walking through sort of the steps of healing, which by the way, the book describes what's called the growth strategy, G-R-O-W-T-H. And this is like an acronym where letter by letter, it basically guides you through a gut healing process and you emerge on the other side. And at a minimum, from my perspective, I'm not here to promise um, that everyone has universal results just by doing this. What I'm promising is empowerment. Um, so in the growth strategy, as you move through, the first step is root cause analysis, what, like understanding what's going on. And if you have something like the big three of food sensitivity, the reason why I call them the big three is because these are the three things, they're not the most common causes of food intolerances. They're the three things that I want to be absolutely sure as a medical doctor that they are not there. Because if they are there and I fix them, those food intolerances will be gone or mostly gone. Um, but when we move beyond that, let's pretend that we have ruled these three things out, right? You are not constipated. You do not have celiac disease. You do not have gallbladder dysfunction. And we're moving beyond this you still have a food intolerance. You are still struggling with your food. You don't feel well. Okay, we, this is where we get into the phase of actually applying the elimination diet. Because we're trying to figure out what specific foods are causing trouble for you. 
And there can be a pattern to this that helps you, like if you understand the pattern, it helps you to really drill down on what's going on with your body. That pattern could include a sensitivity to FODMAPs. FODMAP is an acronym that basically refers to the fermentable parts of our foods. So think about like lactose in dairy. 70% of the world has an intolerance to lactose. But it could be an intolerance to the parts of beans or to whole grains or to garlic or to fruits. There's these specific foods that have specific components that may cause you trouble. So 70%, are you saying 70% of the world cannot eat dairy products because of the lactose? So with a food intolerance, one of the points that I probably should have made earlier, that's a little bit different than food allergies. Food allergy is like, if you have a dairy allergy and I put one drop of milk on your tongue, you might trigger that reaction and that's a scary thing. With a food intolerance, there is a threshold that exists that is individualized to you of how much you can actually handle. And it's actually a moving target, meaning that we can change that. We can actually make you more capable of tolerating this food that you struggle with. So if it's a lactose intolerance, meaning that you, have, you struggle with dairy and you get like a lot of people get bloating or they get diarrhea. So there's an amount that your body is able to tolerate. And when I say 70%, what I mean is that 70% of the world can't tolerate a normal bowl of ice cream or a normal tall glass of milk. It will trigger symptoms for them. But they can tolerate some. It might be one scoop of ice cream or a half of a glass of milk. And this is part of what separates a food intolerance from a food allergy is that there is an amount that you're capable of tolerating. And the other thing is you're actually able to practice and teach your body to become more adapted to it. And so I say 70% of the world is intolerant to dairy, but like there, there's actually very clear research on this topic showing that you could take these people and if you properly handle their gut, they actually become capable of tolerating the dairy, even though they weren't at baseline. I was also going to say, I think a lot of people have just grown accustomed to tolerating the symptoms right? So yeah. they're just routinely having gas or some bloating or irregular so pizza stool. And then have diarrhea. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. not even full diarrhea, but just like it's not normal, but they're kind of just like they've become so used to that that they don't really process that it's because of something they just did. So right. they're, they're intolerant, but they're tolerating the symptom of the intolerance for you know, indefinitely, maybe. This is something that I think is only on my mind because I'm a new mom, but it's a follow-up question to what you just said about lactose. Human breast milk has lactose in it, right? So how is 70% of the human population intolerant to it? It's a good question. Um, so children clearly are not intolerant to human breast milk. But what's interesting is that if mom consumes dairy in her own diet, many times this will actually create intolerances for the, for the nursing child. Yes, so like I have seen that extremely common and, and many moms will find better success in terms of their child who has, you know, reflux or spitting up or other sort of digestive issues. Many moms will find that, that the child is better off when they eliminate dairy products from their own diet as a mom. You know, it's a good question, Adrian. I don't have a very clear answer because I'm not sure of how much lactose actually is in human breast milk. Um, but there does be, seem to be this distinction where like, you know, similarly, if you take a child who's formula fed, there's a pretty hefty percentage of children who are formula fed that struggle with dairy-based formula and are better when you transition to something that's not dairy-based. So um, I think that these things, these issues still exist in our children. It's just differences in what they're being exposed to. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And I have several friends who are new moms in nursing and coming to me and I'm like, I am no expert at all trying to troubleshoot clear sim digestive symptoms in their babies as like, do, should I stop nursing? Is it something about my breast milk or should I take something out of my diet or should you know, are they on a bad formula? Should I be switching it? There's so many different nuances, especially since 
some people I know are doing nursing and formula. So trying to really isolate the issue is even harder. So um, it's all very, very confusing. And that's why we're talking about this today to try to give people some, some clarity. Um, well, if you took that situation, so let's, let's treat it as if the baby has a food intolerance, right? We could apply literally the exact same principles that I'm teaching for adults, which is that, you know, the baby is struggling. You're trying to figure out, is there a food that's triggering these symptoms? And you move through a process that's a structured process to see if you can prove that something is problematic. So women will often eliminate dairy from their, from their diet and see if the child improves. But you would also consider eliminating spicy foods, spicy and acidic foods from your diet, right? And so th there's, a, again, there's a very similar process. It's just that it's being sort of distilled through the nursing relationship, but actually it ends up being the same concept that we're talking about for adults. I'm glad we brought some clarity to that. Um, and on that topic, the concept of genetic food intolerances, right, is something that you were talking about, like sort of an irreversible chronic health issue slash like you're born with it, it's genetic versus something that can be worked on and improved. So can you talk about when something is for sure a chronic health issue that can't be reversed? Because I know a lot of people who've been told by medical doctors very nonchalantly without trying anything else that things are genetic just with their children, with themselves. Oh, that's just genetic, i.e. there isn't really anything you can do about it. And I get very, I think that's unfair. I think people need to yeah. go through the process of trying to work on something and see if it can be approved before they say that it's just genetic. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it feels a little flippant to me. It feels a little flippant and, and kind of almost... Um, uh, lazy, recognizing not, not that the doctor is lazy, but instead recognizing that the doctor is very limited in terms of time resource. And so if something requires a significant time burden, they're frankly going to look for ways to try to eliminate that if they could, right? So there are certain ones that are genetic. Let's pretend that a person has celiac disease. Celiac disease is a genetically motivated condition. If I diagnose a person with celiac disease, my recommendation to them is they go gluten-free. And there is no option. There is no option unless something changes in science to bring gluten back into the diet. So not even in the most trivial, minuscule amounts. Another example that I talk about in the book, and I think this is something that's going to help a lot of people potentially, is sucrose intolerance. Now, sucrose is a word that many people have probably heard. They're like, oh, I've heard that. What is that? It's table sugar. And table sugar is like literally in everything. But sucrose doesn't just come from sugar cane. Sucrose also is a sugar that exists in very healthy foods. You could be like, you know, consuming beets or a sweet potato. And it's like, the, there's no denying that these are healthful foods, but they happen to contain sucrose. Some people have a condition called congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, CSID. It's a mouthful. Don't worry about the mouthful. Just recognize this. This is the important part that I want people to hear and take away. If you have gas and bloating and diarrhea or diarrhea, doesn't have to be both. And like, perhaps you've been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. You need to be tested for congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency. It's a breath test. It's non-invasive. In the United States, it's actually free, believe it or not. And there is an enzyme that actually is naturally sourced and can be life-changing for people who discovered that they have this issue. So now this is a congenital thing, meaning that you are born with this, but it may not manifest. This is where it's kind of a paradoxical weird thing. It may not manifest until later in life. I've had people in their 60s and 70s that I diagnosed with this. They're not in their 20s exclusively. But the point is, if you have gas bloating or diarrhea, you need to be tested for this and don't accept the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. If you have CSID, it's a congenital thing. And so from my perspective, you can't just like make food adaptations to fix it. You would either have to go on a hyper-restrictive diet, which I do not recommend because I think that that's in your long-term, um, in the long-term, it's not good for your health. Or alternatively, you could introduce this digestive enzyme and you quite simply use a couple drops of it with every meal 
and it fixes the whole problem. So that's not many that are actually gene based or, or congenital diseases, but there are many other, you know, eczema and these things that people are being told right and left are genetics rather than something they can do something about. Well, so here's the problem. I mean, it's hard to um, go through every single one of these possibilities. Right. You're you just... like, we can't list them all, but yeah. Well, if you, if you go to chapter one of my first book, Fiber Fueled, if you go to chapter one, one of the things that I did there is I created tables where I listed all of the medical conditions that I could find a research study to say that there is a connection to your gut microbiome. And the, the argument that I'm making is not that this is that these medical conditions like eczema, by the way, where there's a connection to the gut microbiome. I'm not making the argument that the only thing that matters is your gut microbiome, but the evidence indicates that there is a connection to your gut microbiome. Well, your gut microbiome is interesting because it accounts for 99.5% of your genetic code, but it's also completely adaptable. So what that means is that we can call it genetic, but maybe it's not like genetic coming from your human genome but instead is coming from your microbial genome. And that could be changed. We could adapt that. That's so fascinating. I think there is, of all the health topics that are out there and that I've covered, genes are the most full of myths and mis misconceptions and that are repeated right and left in medical practices every day. It's, um, uh, it's wild. It, it's, it's sort of our own fault because actually where I think that a lot of that comes from is the popular narrative for decades on end. Once we like Lewis and Crick, you know, discovered DNA and the double helix. And we think that this is the Holy grail. That's what we thought. And we built it up as such for decades. And it was around 2000, 2001 that um, they actually cracked the human genetic code for the first time. And they thought that they would cure heart disease and cancer. And clearly they have not. And the reason why is because actually they didn't have the tools in 2001 to study the gut microbiome. Those tools became available in 2006. And now here we are, and it's time for us to revise this. Everything is not just uh, genetic. Even people who have heart disease that runs in the family, you are not predetermined to, to have a heart attack. But instead, that's probably a generational thing where a family is passing down some genetic code but also a whole lot of gut microbes and also familial patterns of diet and lifestyle. And that's what passes and transfers on that trait. It's not that you're, the genetic code by itself explains it because we don't have proof of that. That's so interesting. Yeah. Okay. So we are almost out of time, which is wild, but I have a couple of questions, sort of rapid fire questions related to some of the recipes and things in your book. So I'm just going to start. So what do you find to be the best sources of plant-based protein? Because I definitely struggle with this issue. And could you just name a few of the highlights that are in your book, as well as just in your normal family, you know, weekly meals um, that you feel like have great sources of, of plant-based protein? So first of all, I think it's important for people to understand that the foundation of a plant-based diet is not fresh produce. It's legumes and whole grains from my perspective. And then you top it with some fresh produce, but the majority of your calories are coming from the legumes and whole grains, and they are a rich source of plant-based protein. Beyond that, you know, I am a huge fan of tempeh as a quick example of one. It's fermented, right? It's uh, adaptable. It will absorb flavors that you add to it. And this is part of what makes tempeh really cool. Now, at baseline, without any additional flavor, it's a little funky, um, so people may be a little bit weird about it without adding any spices to it, but add the spices, make it what you want it to be. So this is, th this is the approach from my perspective. I just speaking for myself, Adrian, I am uh, a very large guy. I'm six foot four. I weigh 205 pounds. I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm lifting more in my bench press than I've ever lifted in my life. And I do not take a protein supplement. I eat a plant-based diet. And it's just that the, the variety and that foundation of legumes and whole grains, I honestly don't even worry about it, to be totally honest with you. And just for anybody that isn't familiar, tempeh is a fermented form of, of tofu, which is soy. Um, so, you know, I've always been very careful to only have organic soy, right, because of totally the agree. genetic modification. So the totally same agree. would hold true for tempeh as well, correct? 
Yeah. So, so the issue with the genetic modification is um, that it's being modified to be tolerant of glyphosate. And most of that is because you're creating feed for the animal agriculture. So you, that's what we're, they're feeding the cows or the pigs. But um, if you get it organic, by definition, it cannot be sprayed with glyphosate and it cannot be genetically modified to allow it to be sprayed with glyphosate. And so this is, I, I think anytime you buy soy, soy milk, tofu, tempeh, um, miso, I always want it organic. Got it. So can you just name a couple of your favorite recipes in the book that just offhand, obviously you can't spell out the whole recipe, but just some of the favorite meals that are in your own diet routinely and that you feel like are highlights? Well, the ones that are in my own diet, we're a real family. We're real people. My food at home does not look like the pictures in this book. <laughs> the pictures <laughs> are far more beautiful. And, you know, I don't cook 125 different recipes. We cook, you know, we have 10 or 12 on rotation that we love. Um, I'm a big fan of bowls. You know, I love bowls because you start off with something that's basic and then you get to basically uh, adapt them to your personal dietary preferences. So my bowl is different than say my wife or my son's bowl. There's a delicious mango burrito bowl in the book, super easy, and you can literally make it in probably five minutes if you want to. So that's a good one. We were talking about tempeh. If, we're, if I'm getting more into a special treat recipe, like I'm showing off a little bit in the kitchen, then the sweet and spicy peanut tempeh lettuce wraps. So think about lettuce wraps at PF Chang's. We all like those, but they could be very unhealthy, but you can create them in your own way using tempeh and it's like, it's a huge win. Awesome. And then this is a very random question for you, but you talk a lot about sourdough in your book. Uh, and I love sourdough. And I think the history of sourdough is so interesting and sort of the nature of the fermentation, which I think a lot of people don't understand that it's, you can ferment, have fermented bread, same way you can have fermented tofu or fermented pickles, or I'm sorry, fermented cucumbers, which are pickles. Um, but is, I avoid gluten because I have Hashimoto's. Is gluten-free sourdough a thing? Because I would love to eat it, but I avoid it because of the gluten. You would have to create, it's not easy to do this. I don't have a recipe for this in the book. Um, you would have to create sourdough using a gluten-free whole grain. And part of the challenge there is that gluten is actually a, you know, as much as we sort of vilify it, um, it's actually a requisite part of creating the elasticity in the dough that gives it the rise, yeah. right? So yeah. there's a reason that it's there. Sourdough is substantially reduced in gluten content. So the microbes are actually getting rid of the gluten in a lot of ways. That's part of why sourdough bread is much more dense than other forms of bread. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, but it is not gluten-free if you're making it with wheat or with rye, something like that. So it's something to be conscious of. Now, like, do I believe that people who are Hashimoto's need to be like avoid sourdough bread? I personally don't believe that, but I certainly understand where people who have Hashimoto's have made the decision to go gluten-free. And that makes sense to me. I think then the key is in that setting, you have to focus on the gluten-free whole grains. You'd have to find a baker who's doing that is, is I guess the answer. Got it. Or maybe, I mean, I since it's not celiac, but it is something that's been recommended to me by doctors I see for my thyroid condition. Uh, maybe it's a special occasion thing where I can, you know, have it now and then. I, Cause I certainly, you know, cheat on, cheat on it a bit. Well, I uh, think that's a personal, that's a personal choice to some degree. It's not celiac disease. If a person has celiac disease, I would say they should never have any gluten exposure at all. With Hashimoto's, the, um, the evidence that gluten is problematic for Hashimoto's is not this radically robust thing. There is some evidence and I'm, and I'm willing to acknowledge that, but I think it comes back to the conversation that you and I were having earlier about humility and recognizing that this is a moving target. So if a person takes a position, like your doctor says to you, you should avoid gluten and you decide that you're going to go gluten-free. I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong or that you should have sourdough on a daily basis. I'm not saying that either, but we also really don't know the answer to that question. Could sourdough be consumed on a routine interval, recognizing that when it comes to gluten and gluten containing foods, <clears throat> there's a big difference between like a homemade sourdough where you bought the organic high quality flour. There's a big difference between that and like the white bread in your store. Right. Right. So, or even just, you know, buying sourdough on a shelf because anytime something is packaged, there's some 
processing, right? And so it's yeah. um, not going to be the same level of quality. And uh, as a new mom, I'm not sure I'm really making a lot of bread these days for my time. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, she's taking a nap. I have to shower and do work and do a million things. So um, I think, you know, it's it's obviously anybody's choice, but I was I love sourdough bread. And when I was reading about it in your book, I thought maybe he could tell me a way to, to get gluten-free sourdough. Okay, well, this has been just so interesting, food allergies, food sensitivities, um, the connection between the microbiome and the genetic code, which I think is so fascinating and really hadn't been explained to me in that way. And, and just hearing doctors practice what you, what you called lazy medicine, but really it's time constrained medicine, um, by just chalking things up to genetics or people that I love before any other, you know, elimination diets are pursued drives me a little nuts. So um, I'm very glad to hear you explain the connection between these things and how somebody saying something genetic does not mean it's not adaptable or can be improved um, because of this uh, ability to change the microbiome and how much the microbiome influences your genetic code. I think it's just so, it really is like a, a circle. So well, thank you so much. Is there anything else we haven't talked about that, you know, people really need to know, you know, besides the fact that they should absolutely pick up a copy of the Fiber Fueled Cookbook? Okay, so I'll, I'll have a quick comment on the Fiber Fueled Cookbook in a moment before we head out. But first, let me say this, that um, I am a repeat uh, guest on the show, which I'm very grateful for. And when I was here in 2020, we talked about the importance of diversity of plants. We touched on that today. So no matter what your dietary pattern is, I'm not here to get you to eat like me, but I do want to empower you with the tools to apply to your own life so that you can actually have better gut health, better health throughout your body, and simultaneously have great joy in the food that you consume. So we talked about diversity of plants. You should apply this to your life. I hope I'm not annoying you when you're in the supermarket and you hear my voice. I mean, I hope you don't get sick of hearing me. Not but at the all. Point is, Everyone should be doing this. But here's the new thing for 2022. Brand new study came out less than a year ago saying that if you add fermented food to your diet, basically it was a clinical trial. They took a group of people who were not eating fermented food for the most part, and they added fermented food to their diet. And they discovered that in just 10 weeks, they increased the diversity in their microbiome. That's a measure of better health. And they also reduced measures of inflammation. So the bottom line is that if you're not eating fermented food, this is another opportunity for you to enhance your gut health. We all should be doing it. Awesome. And to circle back to one of your recommended sources of plant-based protein, tempeh is a fermented version of tofu. So if you've never tried tempeh, you know, find it in the grocery store, make sure you get it organic. Um, and like Dr. B said, or Will said, uh, you can uh, use a lots of different spices to make it flavorful um, and uh, give it a go. So tempeh, miso, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, you could do in my in my cookbook, we have fermented salsa. Um, obviously, there's sourdough bread, you could do kefir, you could do water kefir, you could do kombucha, go down the line, there's so many great choices when it comes to fermented food. So it's just something that we all need to be focused on. And that's part of what the book is. So just to comment real quick, the book is meant to be a toolkit for better gut health. And it's meant to be applied to your own life in a way that works for you. This is not this is not a rigid protocol. Um, what it is instead is a bunch of choices. And it's choose your own adventure for gut health what works for you? Let me try to empower you. Let me give you information that could change your life. Let me show you how to overcome food intolerances if you have those. And if you're already healthy, gosh, the gut is connected to your digestion, your immune system, your metabolism, your hormones, your mood, your brain health, your energy levels, your genetic code. This is uh, not something that we should neglect. We should be nurturing this precious commodity. And so this book, it shows you that person who's healthy, how to do that as well. So I think this is where it's like the book can be applied and show you how to get better gut health. Awesome. Yes. And as somebody that, though I have Hashimoto's, it's it's very mild. Some might even say it's subclinical, but so I'm quote unquote healthy, but I've learned there is no such thing. You have to keep on top of your health every single day. It is so easy to lose and so hard to 
get it back. You know, you really have to work at it. So you have to work at it every day. And the best way to work at your health every day is with each meal that you make. So this is a book for, for everybody. And certainly, you know, the, the latest clinical trial that you shared about fermented foods and, and the just plethora of research about a plant-based diet being effective uh, for every, just every possible health condition. And a plant-based diet being a very inclusive thing, by the way, my, my version of a plant-based diet is to say that I, I there, it's not just one size fits all. There are many versions of a plant-based diet. There are many versions of a healthful diet. And it's not just an exclusively plant-based thing either. You could be 70, 80, 90, 100%. But my concern is that like myself 10 years ago, I was 5% plant-based. My concern is that 95% of America is fiber deficient. My concern is that the average American right now is 10% plant-based. Let me build a bridge. And I welcome anyone who wants to step onto that bridge. And I don't care how far you take it. You don't have to take it all the way to 100% plant-based. The person that I have a problem with is the person who's holier than thou and says that this is an exclusive thing. This is not an exclusive thing. This is a party and we all get to be a part of that party if you want to. Absolutely. And I fully support everything that you do. And I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan or whatever. So I think of myself as wanting to eat, you know, majority of my meals from like the fiber fueled cookbook, but I still eat meat. I still eat dairy. I'll still eat a processed food now and then. Um, So you're right. It's not at all exclusive, but it's just something that we can use as a foundation, um, no matter what else you're eating. So thank you so much for being on the show again. And we, as I, as I already said, grab a copy of this cookbook, especially with all of the different, it's faster, honestly, than like plant-based uh, recipes, I think are faster for my family to put together now than, you know, marinating a lot of meat in this and that. So I think it's really great for busy families like ours um, and especially for weeknights and school nights and all of that. So thank you again. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, everyone.